Welcome everyone, and thank you Funda and the organizing committee for the very kind invitation to discuss this exciting and rapidly developing target space of RNA metabolism and splicing. Now, these are my disclosures. Now over the past decade or so, there's been some remarkable discoveries in how many cancers evolve dependencies on the core pathways of RNA metabolism that I'm showing you here where some oncogenes or other epigenetic contexts can drive really striking synthetic lethalities with the core molecular machines marked here in blue that conduct each of these major steps in RNA processing. Now certainly targeting regulators of transcriptional programs like ER and other transcription factors, that's not a new approach in cancer therapeutics. But what I'm referring to here is the, the surprising realization that many cancers harbor unique dependencies on the more global actors of RNA metabolism, from core transcriptional CDKs to the spliceosome to the nuclear export complex and beyond. And indeed, there's an entirely new generation of therapeutics that target these global processes and are showing remarkably selective activity in preclinical models of cancer. Some are even making their way to the cancer clinic, if not already there. But with all of that progress and compelling activities of these therapeutics, the science is moving rapidly to try to catch up, to try to explain how do these drugs work? And more specifically, how does targeting such global regulators of RNA metabolism elicit a selective effect or a therapeutic index in cancer? And so in today's talk, we'll discuss some recent advances addressing that question in the context of RNA splicing. And we'll do that in three parts. First, I'll start with a, a brief introduction as to why we and many others in the cancer community are so interested in RNA splicing. And then I'll share with you two vignettes studying splicing targeted therapies, how they work, and the unanticipated discovery that some SDTs may awaken anti-tumor immunity in some new ways. Now, I think one of the most surprising clues of the importance of RNA metabolism in cancer actually came from the sequencing of tumor genomes. While the early days of, of tumor virology had given us some hints, uh, I think our eyes were open to the importance of RNA splicing when landmark sequencing studies revealed that some of the core components of splicing and other factors in RNA metabolism are among the most frequently somatic mutations uh, in many subtypes of cancer. Now this suggested that dysregulated RNA metabolism is perhaps a common hallmark of many, uh, if not all cancers. Now, if we zoom in on breast cancer specifically, two pivotal genome sequencing studies nearly a decade ago from Mike Stratton's team at the Sanger and Elaine Martis and Matthew Ellis while they were at WashU, their teams independently discovered hotspot mutations in SF3B1, a core component of the U2 complex in the spliceosome. Now, please let me remind you that the spliceosome is really a macromolecular machine that conducts splicing on nearly every intron of every mRNA in the transcriptome. And SA3B1 is actually a non-redundant, really core protein in this process. Now this exciting discovery uh, provided strong evidence, genetic evidence that dysregulated splicing, perhaps global dysregulation is selected for during the evolution of at least some breast cancers. But as I've noted here, these hotspot mutations are pretty rare. Uh, thus raising the question, how common or how generalized is dysregulated RNA splicing in breast cancer? Now fast forward a decade um, and thousands of breast cancer transcriptomes later, and I think the data is quite convincing that aberrations in RNA splicing are indeed widespread in breast cancer. Shown here is a recent analysis where Lucas Simon, a computational colleague from Baylor, examined global RNA processing defects in RNA-seq data from a cohort of primary TMBCs. And a few things I'd like to draw your attention to. First, as you can see on the left, some TMB some TMBCs harbor really extensive misplicing, as denoted here by intron retention in this RNA, while others do not. And this tells us that there are perhaps underlying differences in these tumors in the ability to splice or to quality control their RNA. Second, if one pans out and takes a trans, uh, transcriptome level view, uh, you can see that defective splicing doesn't occur at just a few genes, but is occurring really across thousands of mRNAs. Please take note here of the x-axis, uh, with more than half of these TMBCs harboring misplicing at more than a quarter of their transcriptome. 
So this tells us that defects in RNA splicing are not limited to SF3B1 mutant tumors, and is at least suggestive that perhaps aberrant splicing could be a hallmark of many breast cancers. And lastly, what I find to be most striking is that the patterns of misplicing appear to be different among these TMBCs. For instance, if you cluster these same 47 patient tumors, not by gene expression, but rather by their misplicing, you can see these TMBCs separate into several distinct clades or clusters. Now, while the N is low in this analysis, and it certainly needs to be extended, I think this clustering suggests that there may be several distinct mechanisms driving misplicing in breast cancer and perhaps even unique vulnerabilities or targets underlying the splicing dysregulation. So that hypothesis that there are selective vulnerabilities in RNA splicing components among breast cancers is really supported by a wealth of functional genomic studies. And one of the earliest studies of this kind in breast cancer was from Ben Neal's group, whose team conducted genome-wide shRNA screens across more than 70 breast cancer cell lines along with annotation of their genomes and transcriptomes. And what that study and others like it taught us was that dependency on RNA splicing factors varied really considerably if one looks at the heterogeneity across this heat map. And this tells us that the genetic or epigenetic context of breast cancer cells could perhaps dictate differential sensitivity to RNA splicing perturbations. Now the challenge here, of course, is to define what exactly drives some tumor models to be dependent on a given set of splicing proteins, but others are not. Here, we and others have leveraged isogenic synthetic lethal screens to identify oncogene-dependent vulnerabilities in splicing. Now, one prominent example that emerged from our team about a decade ago was the observation that MYC, one of the most common oncogenes in breast cancer, especially in TMBC and luminal Bs, that MYC confers very potent synthetic lethality with perturbations in certain components of the spliceosome. SA3B1 is shown here as just one of many splicing components that are mixed synthetic lethal. And that's important because you may know that SA3B1 is the molecular target of several tool compounds and therapeutics. So this and other mechanistic data has led to the translational hypothesis uh, that MIG-driven breast cancers may be vulnerable to STTs like the SA3B1 targeting agent 8800. Now, we and a, a team of collaborators at Baylor are testing this hypothesis uh, in a cohort of proteogenomically characterized TNBC PDXs. Now, while it's early days, it's pretty clear that we're now seeing single agent activity in some of these MIC driven models. And there's a lot of enthusiasm about whether MIC alone or probably in combination may be a biomarker of response to 8800 or other STTs like it. But the broader implication, and the reason that I'm showing you this example, is one, I think it's a nice illustration of the surprising therapeutic index for targeted therapies that hit such broadly acting processes like RNA splicing. And second, this really raises the possibility that many STTs with different mechanisms of action may actually have context-dependent efficacy in breast cancer and beyond. Now, of course, the splicing aficionados in the audience will know that this is already a rich 20-year history in this chemical biology space that we refer to loosely as splicing targeted therapies, or STTs. Now, while there are several exciting classes of STTs, much of the focus has historically been on SA3B1 modulators, shown here on the left, with several natural products and distinct pharmacophores targeting SA3B1 and its interactors. But more recently, there's been a lot of progress and excitement on molecular glues that degrade RBM39 or other splicing proteins, as well as a whole host of therapeutics that inhibit proteins that regulate splicing through various post-translational modifications on the spliceosome. Now, all of these programs are at various stages of preclinical and clinical development, but I think it's clear that we're just at the beginning of this therapeutic space that impinges on RNA splicing in different ways. And that has really raised the flag to us and to many others that we have to learn how these SCTs work, how they elicit their therapeutic effects, and which I think these kind of questions are going to be critical in guiding how we best de deploy them in the clinic. 
And that will be the focus of the two vignettes that we're gonna talk about for the rest, of, the rest of our time together today. Where I'll touch on two different areas of investigation, studying how SDTs work and how that has unveiled some exciting new opportunities to exploit these therapeutics as modulators of anti-tumor immunity. Now I'm gonna use the next couple of slides to, to provide a, a bit of mechanistic framework for how we think SCTs may be triggering the immune system, and then we'll dive deeper into some of the data standing behind these exciting new corrections. Now, as we've been discussing, many breast cancer oncogenes and drivers are now being shown to dysregulate RNA splicing through a number of different mechanisms. These include partially reducing the function of the spliceosome, like SA3B1 mutations, or on the flip side, by elevating global transcription um, in the case of potent transcription factors like MYC or the estrogen receptor, which ultimately puts a burden on splicing from the RNA substrate perspective. And there are many other mechanisms emerging as well. But what's important here is that these drivers are putting liabilities on the splicing machinery and the splicing capacity of these breast cancers. And this, we believe, sensitizes them to STTs that can perhaps exacerbate accumulation of these misspliced RNAs. And it's these misspliced RNAs that are in part driving tumor cell killing and activation of anti-tumor immunity. And that's really gonna be the linchpin or the focus of the two vignettes that I'll summarize for you today. First, in some really stellar work by Rob Bradley and Omar Abdel Wahab's team, showing that STTs induce misspliced RNAs that may be a pervasive source of neoantigens once translated and presented on tumor cells. And in the second vignette, I'll share with you how some of these misspliced RNAs that accumulate in breast cancer cells can oftentimes form double-stranded structures that look like RNA viruses, thus the term viral mimicry, and can consequently trigger the antiviral innate immune pathways and downstream immune cascades. Now we're gonna start here with this first vignette, investigating if and how STTs could induce the expression of neoepitopes in tumor cells. Now, the basis for this idea is pretty straightforward. As we touched on, um, normal splicing creates an enormous amount of proteomic diversity through the inclusion or exclusion of exonic sequences. And this diversity is really critical in gene regulation uh, and in normal development and in human health. But in the context of cancer, much of that dysregulation and splicing uh, or in that context, the opportunity arises for not only aberrant alternative splicing, but also for many of these introns to be retained in mRNAs and subsequently translated into aberrant proteins that have never been seen um, by the immune system. And indeed, there's been quite a bit of exciting work uh, combining various approaches like RNA-seq, proteomics, MHC-enriched proteomics, and computational approaches all with the goal of annotating what types of neoepitopes might emerge from these altered proteomes of cancer cells. And a few of those studies are listed here at the bottom. And so the extension of this phenomena is of course to ask whether STTs can exacerbate this misplicing and thus unveil novel or more abundant accumulation of altered proteins and neoantigens. And in the study by Bradley and Abdel Wahab teams, they began to address this important challenge by exploiting or exploring three key questions. First, do STTs uh, with very different mechanisms of action, do they elicit different patterns of misplicing and by extension, potentially different repertoire of neoepitopes uh, expressed? Second, do these STTs elicit T cell responses or any other elements of anti-tumor immunity? And lastly, is there any evidence of T cells responding to such putative new epitopes in the context of SCT treatment? So to answer this first question about specificity, uh, Omar and Rob and teams, they evaluated the effect of two SCTs that inhibit different protein targets for their effects on the splicing, including intron retention uh, across the transcriptome. What I'm showing you here on the left is one of those analyses with the molecular glue inducilam that causes degradation of the splicing factor RBM39. Now, as you can see here in the RNA-seq data, uh, emphasized in blue, is there's a robust effect on intron retention with more than a thousand RNAs exhibiting uh, really robust splicing. 
And importantly, many of these transcripts are found inside the cytoplasmic fraction of these cancer cells, indicating that they actually could be translated by the ribosome. And what's important here is that when they compared the misplicing effects of Dusalam and another SCT, MS023, in four different tumor models, you can see that the effect for a given agent is fairly consistent across very different tumor cell lines as shown here with the blue clustering, but that the effects of misplicing between the two agents is not nearly as well correlated. And this raises the intriguing possibility that different SCTs may induce different forms of misplicing and therefore a different spectrum or pattern of aberrant proteins and neoantigens. Now that obviously has some important implications in the immune oncology space, uh, and that's an important point we'll come back to in just a minute. But does this misplicing actually translate into anti-tumor immune response? Well, to answer that question, they treated various tumor models in vitro with SCTs and then engrafted these pretreated tumor cells subcutaneously. And the key aspect of this experimental design is to segregate or to separate out any potential immune effects of the drug, uh, direct immune effects, uh, from those that emanate specifically from tumor cell responses without the complexity of the drug on the host. Now, in the case of Inducilam, uh, in vitro, you can see here a nice uh, dose-dependent effect on target degradation in two different cell models, but really no discernible effect on in vitro tumor cell growth or viability. In contrast, there's really a considerable effect in vivo, at least consistent with the hypothesis that the drug induces a host response that perhaps emanates from the tumor cells. And this is something that was seen across diverse tumor models. So to narrow in on whether this was an immune effect, the same experiment was repeated, but this time treated tumor cells were transplanted into either wild type hosts or hosts that were immune deficient, either through genetics uh, or in this case, through antibody depletion of T cell compartments. And as you can see here, depletion of T cells is really sufficient to mitigate the anti-tumor response or effects of inducilam. And this suggests that there is both a T cell mediated tumor control and that the immune engagement is driven by the tumor cells response to the drug. So this exciting observation really begs the obvious question. Are tumor cells presenting neoantigens and are those epitopes actually derived from displaced RNA? So to begin getting at that question, the Abdel Wahab and Bradley teams use an integrative approach. First, using RNA-seq and computational approaches to define inducilam driven misplicing events, and then translating all those possible new proteoforms, and then predicting the potential peptides that are uh, perhaps MHC binders. And second, uh, in a more experimental approach using an MHC enrichment and LCMSMS uh, to measure MHC bound peptides. And by combining these two approaches, they nominated a cohort of Inducilam induced neoantigens that could be tested for immunogenicity individually in animal models. Really asking the question, which, if any, of these peptides were competent to induce a T cell response? Now, I won't go into the details here, but essentially, they injected synthetic peptides into immune competent mice, um, extracted CD8 positive T cells from the uh, draining lymph nodes, and then exposed those T cells to splenocytes loaded with the cognate peptide. And the results here were pretty astounding, with a, a really significant fraction of the nominated peptides, again, derived from mispliced RNA, generating positive T cell responses in these LE spot assays. Now, these data raise the important implication that the anti-tumor efficacy of SCTs could in part be driven by misspliced RNA and their resulting neoantigens and T cell responses. Now, if this model holds true, uh, and we're going to exploit this mechanism in the context of breast cancer, there are really some critical questions, I think, on the horizon. First, among the diverse species of misspliced RNA found in tumor cells, which are the most efficient at being translated and presented as neoantigens? Second, given that these SCT modalities can elicit very different patterns in misspliced RNA, it'll be critical to delineate which SCTs can induce the most potent neoantigen presentation and concomitant T cell responses. And finally, uh, and I think really importantly here, 
how does tumor heterogeneity impact this approach? And more specifically, can STTs elicit immune responses in typically immunosuppressive and immune cold tumors like, for instance, triple negative breast cancer? And this last question leads nicely to our second vignette, which is focused on a different mechanism by which these misspliced RNAs may contribute to STT efficacy. More specifically, we and now others have made the surprising discovery that many misspliced RNAs unleashed by STTs, that these misspliced RNAs sometimes form double-stranded structures that can resemble RNA viruses, and can in some contexts turn on antiviral pathways that trigger tumor inflammation and activation of downstream host immunity. Now, over the next few slides, I'm gonna walk you through this unusual mechanism and some of its implications for breast cancer therapy. So how did we arrive at this unusual mechanism? Well, really it was through two orthogonal, unbiased approaches that honed in on the same answer. First, we looked for conserved gene expression changes in response to STTs across a panel of TMBC cell lines, two of which are shown here. And GSCA revealed a really striking pattern where nearly all of the positively enriched pathways uh, were involved in double-stranded RNA sensing, interferon signaling, and downstream antiviral transcriptional programs. And indeed, if one drills down into those gene sets, it's pretty clear that SCTs are activating an interferon response and other innate immune antiviral programs. So this data, this data suggests that SCTs are potent inducers of double-stranded RNA sensing in antiviral pathways in cancer cells. But do those pathways actually contribute to cancer cell death? Um, here we got a clue from a second unbiased approach where we leverage genetic screens, uh, which is a core expertise in our lab. Um, in, in essence here, we're looking for resistance to STTs like SC6 uh, or 8800. And pretty remarkably, one can see from this volcano plot five of the top 12 hits from these shRNA screens were components of double-stranded RNA sensing and signal transduction, marked here in red. And when one does an unbiased network analysis, you pretty clearly see the hubs we identify, or at least one of those hubs is an immunity. And more specifically, components of antiviral signaling uh, were found as major effectors of the SCT response. And that's something we've gone on to validate through many independent shRNA, sgRNA, and pharmacologic approaches, like the one shown here. So this and other data has led us to the exciting possibility that SCTs may kill breast cancer cells, at least in part by stimulating antiviral double-stranded RNA signaling. Now just to zoom out a bit for some, for some context, um, as this audience knows well, there's really a lot of excitement in the field to stimulate what many are calling viral mimicry, to inflame tumors with immunologically cold microenvironments. Now, as you know, this process of viral mimicry involves activation of pattern recognition receptors that typically recognize double-stranded DNA or double-stranded RNA viruses. Now, many studies have shown that this process can be activated in tumors with either exogenous nucleic acid ligands or a whole host of different strategies to induce the accumulation of endogenous double-stranded RNA or endogenous double-stranded DNA in tumor cells. And I've listed just a few examples of those approaches here on the left. Now with that context in mind, uh, the data I just showed you provokes the mechanistic hypothesis that SCTs may trigger cancer cell intrinsic antiviral signaling perhaps through accumulation of these misspliced RNAs and subsequent downstream uh, double-stranded RNA sensing mechanisms. And perhaps these ancient antiviral pathways may be a mechanism, perhaps a conserved mechanism, of cancer cell death that is elicited by splicing inhibition. Now, if that's correct, I think this model has some, some pretty obvious implications for how we might leverage SCTs. But before we get there, I'd like to walk you through a couple of the the core tenets and predictions of this model, and just a few snippets of data that support it. First, this model suggests that splicing perturbation leads to accumulation of misspliced RNA in the cytoplasm, since this is specifically where most double-stranded RNA sensors of the antiviral system reside. And much like what the Abdel Wahab lab uh, observed in other tumor types, 
Here we see in TNBC cells by both qPCR and by RNA-seq, cytoplasmic accumulation of intron-retained RNA really across the transcriptome, again, in the cytoplasm of these TNBC cells. And that's something we've confirmed by single molecule approaches like RNA fish shown here. Now, a second really critical prediction of this model is that these misspliced messages are forming double-stranded RNAs. Because of course, it's these double-stranded structures that are the potential triggers for antiviral sensors. And so to begin exploring that hypothesis, we leveraged immunofluorescent imaging-based approaches with antibodies that specifically recognize not proteins, but instead double-stranded RNA structures. And we've used several different antibodies, including the J2 antibody shown here, that recognizes stretches of 40 plus base pairs of a contiguous double-stranded RNA. Now, as one can see here, splices on perturbation leads to a pretty significant accumulation of double-stranded RNA in the cytoplasm of these TNBC cells. And that's quantified over here on the right. And we've actually seen that effect across many TNBC cell lines, but strikingly less so or not at all in many normal cell types, consistent with the selective cell death that's induced by these agents. Now, I think the implication here is important, that misspliced endogenous RNAs, or some fraction of them, are forming double-stranded RNA structures that are accumulating in the cytoplasm and activating antiviral pathways. Now, consistent with that hypothesis, uh, RNA-seq analysis revealed that really thousands of endogenous line and sign elements, which are of course known or predicted to, be to form double-stranded structures, that they're induced by 8800 treatment in TNBC cells. Now what's striking here in these ECDFs is that there's really widespread increase in intron residing repetitive elements uh, that are again residing in the introns, but not in repetitive elements in intergenic regions. And that's from important because there's been a lot of excitement in the past few years in how some epigenetic drugs like DMT inhibitors or EZH2 inhibitors that we just heard about, how they may induce anti-tumor inflammation through intergenic repetitive elements. Now, our data suggests that SCTs may induce perhaps a novel class of these repetitive elements that are residing in introns, and thus open up new angles for how we might exploit viral mimicry. And we've gone on to use an adapted J2 RIPSeq approach uh, to experimentally validate that many of these misspliced RNAs and intronic repetitive elements are indeed forming double-stranded RNA structures in TNBC cells. Now, as the immunologists in the room know well, activation of these double-stranded RNA sensing pathways leads to some hallmark features like extrinsic apoptosis, interferon signaling, and other inflammatory transcriptional responses and sometimes downstream recruitment of cellular immunity. Now, I'm not going to have time to walk through all the data today, but suffice it to say, uh, we see many of the telltale signs upon SCT treatment, including induction and transcriptional programs of double-stranded RNA pathways, downstream cytokine and chemokine expression, um, as well as um, really potent activation of extrinsic caspase 8 dependent cell death. Now, collectively, these and other data have told us that SCTs are inducing a really potent cancer cell intrinsic antiviral response and cell death. But beyond these cancer cell intrinsic effects, this audience also knows well that such antiviral pathways can sometimes trigger adaptive uh, or downstream adaptive immune responses. Now, I'm going to end the last couple of slides today uh, with some preliminary studies where we've begun to investigate that hypothesis that SCTs may prime or stimulate an adaptive response. Now to explore that possibility, uh, we began by evaluating the response of multiple immune competent animal models of TNBC for their response to 8800, shown above. Now, as one can see, there's really some heterogeneity in the efficacy of 8800 in these models. And what's intriguing is that the sensitive models shown over here on the left exhibit really potent activation of targets in the antiviral double-stranded RNA response, but resistant models do not. If one zooms out and does GSCA for distinctions between the sensitive and the resistant models, something pretty striking emerges. Shown here is clustering not of genes, but of gene signatures, where each column is actually a tumor model and each row is actually a gene signature. And what's striking is that uh, from these gene expression signatures, is that the sensitive 
and, but not the resistant models, almost exclusively express these very potent immune signatures, including innate antiviral signaling, as well as production of chemoattractants and adaptive immune cells. So this raises the intriguing possibility that SCTs might stimulate recruitment of CTL or other adaptive immune compartments in some TNBCs, similar to what was seen by the Bradley and Abdel Wahab teams. And while this is preliminary data, that's exactly what we're, we're beginning to observe. Here you can see uh, in a sensitive TNBC gem model that AN 8800 is inducing CD8 positive T cell infiltration into these tumors. And while this data is preliminary, we are interested in exploring how STTs may be used as potent stimulators of anti-tumor immunity in various disease settings, especially in the context of immune cold TNBCs. If that's in a mouse model, what about in patients? Well, the short answer is it's too early to know, um, as these SA3B1 targeting STTs are in early stages of clinical development. But one provocative question this discovery has led us to ask is whether there's evidence of such communication between RNA misplicing and breast cancer in the immune system in the absence of STTs. In other words, is endogenous misplicing or misprocessing of RNA, which is a common feature in many breast cancers, perhaps a trigger for immune engagement? Now I'll end this discussion with one tantalizing piece of data where we've explored RNA-seq data from TCGA in a unique way. First, by calculating the intron retention as a proxy for misplicing across all tumors in this cohort. And then ask what pathways correlate with high levels of misplicing uh, in these tumors. Now, quite strikingly, we observe many cellular compartments of the immune system um, correlating very strongly with intron retention. And really importantly, this is an independent uh, marker, uh, or excuse me, it's independent of tumor mutational burden suggesting that intron retention and the splicing may be an independent factor contributing to immune engagement. Moreover, patients with cancers that have high intron retention also have a better disease-free survival, consistent with the idea that such immune engagement may be participating in tumor control. Now, this is obviously an early result, but provokes the idea that perhaps throughout the genesis of cancer, certain types of RNA misplicing may be signaling to or speaking to the immune system through some of the mechanisms we've discussed today. Now, I think many in the field are now actively pursuing that hypothesis uh, and the rules of, the engage of that engagement so we can really better understand how to leverage SCTs as immune-based therapies. Now, in the interest of time, I'm not gonna recap the model, but rather leave you with just a few forward-looking directions. First, I've shown you that some SDTs, like 8800, can activate antiviral signaling and neoantigen generation. But it's very much an open question as to which spliceosome perturbations best stimulate these mechanisms and unveil anti-tumor efficacy. And that will be important to solve as we move these programs into the clinic. Second, we're very interested in both the types of endogenous RNAs that trigger these responses and also which double-stranded RNA sensing pathways are engaging these RNAs. Because we think there's enormous opportunity here to learn how to exploit these pathways and predict mechanisms of resistance to drugs that target RNA splicing. And finally, uh, we're very early days, but intrigued by the idea that one could exploit the differences in RNA splicing between normal and malignant states, and perhaps learn how to combine SDTs with immune modulating therapeutics for rational combination approaches. And with that, I'd like to thank our teams and collaborators, um, all of those uh, whose work I cited, and of course, the enormous amount uh, of work and colleagues uh, that I didn't get to cite. Um, I also thank the audience for your attention um, and look forward to the Q&A session. Thank you.